now going to look at the Gospels and see what they have to say about the resurrection. Now, one of the interesting things there right off the top is that though the Gospels are written uh, considerably later than Paul, as most people think, the stories they tell are very simple, and we'll come to that in a minute. There's an odd to and fro that we have to do between the Gospels and Paul to try to work out what it was they were both talking about. And it's interesting, while we're on introductory matters, to notice that none of the canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, describes the resurrection itself. They None of them describe Jesus coming out of the tomb or Jesus waking up, if you like, in the tomb. They describe what happened next with people mm -hmm. discovering an empty tomb and then strangely meeting the risen Jesus. Now, various things to say about the Gospels as a whole. Now, the first, which is quite important, is that they are clearly not made up simply to fit with a standard Jewish explanation. We said before yeah. that the big text for Jews of this period and later was Daniel chapter 12, which has the righteous shining like stars in the kingdom of the Father. If you were a Jew wanting to make up a story saying that Jesus of Nazareth was raised from the dead, highly likely you'd have had him shining like a star. He doesn't do that, which yeah. is very interesting. These stories are clearly belonging within the Jewish world of storytelling, like times when God does something dramatic in the Old Testament, but they're not the sort of stories you would expect them to make up about resurrection. Likewise, they are quite unlike the pagan stories in which recently departed heroes uh, may come back as apparitions or whatever. Thirdly, and this I think is very important for comparing the Gospels with Paul, the Gospels are quite free of Old Testament allusions and echoes in the resurrection narratives themselves. We're not here talking about uh, a weaving together of, of this or that Old Testament text. And that's the more interesting because Paul has a great deal of uh, Old Testament coming mm -hmm. through. Definitely. And the Gospels up until that point, including the Passion narratives, mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. been full of the Old Testament. It looks as though they're really quite sort of clean and clear very interesting that. The next thing to say is that the Gospels emphasize the element of surprise. It's quite clear that the disciples weren't expecting it. They didn't say, oh yeah, fine, he told us he'd be rising again and here mm -hmm. he is, guess mm -hmm. what? Uh, they were shocked and horrified and, and couldn't figure out what it was all about. And there's another thing to notice about what they all say. They all talk about the women going to the tomb. And this, for somebody in the first century, is just all wrong. It's upside down and inside out for this reason, that whether we like it or not, mm -hmm. if you were giving witnesses in a court of law in the ancient world, you would not use women because they were not regarded as reliable testimony. And yet these Gospels insist that the women were the first there and they were the first ones to tell the story about meeting these women. So that if you imagine somebody sitting down 10, 20, 30 years later to invent a story about Jesus being raised from the dead, you sure as anything wouldn't have put those women front and center on it. Then I want to insist the stories are at their strangest when they are hinting at the nature of Jesus' body. And this ties in with what we were saying before with Paul about this transformed physicality. They clearly want to say it's the same body because he's got the marks in his mm -hmm. hands and feet and his side, but it seems to have different properties so that it can now pass <laughs> through locked doors and that sort of thing, and it's not immediately recognized. You know, in John, it says, none of them dared ask him, who are you? Because <laughs> They knew it was the Lord. It's a very odd thing to say about somebody yes, that they've right. been with face to face for years. It's the same Jesus, yet somehow transformed, but not transformed into a kind of glowing, shining astral being wearing a halo and all the kit. Something different again. Now, do you see what's happened? These stories are about a transformed physicality, which is what Paul was talking about, and yet they don't have any of that developed theological reflection and exegetical use of scripture, which we already find in the 50s with Paul, how then do we explain the rise of these stories? You've either got to say that four people independently, post-Paul, mm -hmm. wrote stories designed to encapsulate what Paul was saying, but carefully took out all the theology and exegesis, or you've got to say that these stories, though they were written down a lot later than Paul, actually go back to the eyewitness testimony 
of people, before they've had a chance to go back and think about the Bible or about what it all means, saying to each other, you're not going to believe this, but mm. let me tell you, this is just how it was. And that's the mood that I think I find there. You see, people often say, I had a letter from somebody just the other day who had read something I'd written about the resurrection, and he said, surely what's going on is that Luke and John are writing at the end of the century, and they're the ones who have this very physical <coughs> risen Jesus, because by then there were some people who were saying maybe Jesus wasn't a real human being. He only seemed to be human. And so Luke and John invent these physical resurrection stories to counteract that. Frankly, if that's what Luke and John are doing, they really shot themselves in the foot mm. because if you want to prove that Jesus is a real human being just like us, you don't have him appearing and disappearing and going through locked doors and stuff. So I think whatever the account we give of how those stories came to be, that actually won't do. So what can we then say about the puzzles and problems of the Gospel accounts? You know, John has him in Jerusalem and in Galilee. Luke just has him in Jerusalem. Mark and Matthew say he was in Galilee. It's a bit of a puzzle. And it's difficult to say exactly how many women went to the tomb and which angels mm. they saw there mm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. It's very confusing. But, you know, in the same way, if you try to put together the accounts of the cock crowing when Peter denied Jesus, you can't do it. You have to say something like the croc cock crowed nine mm -hmm. times, <laughs> which none of the accounts <laughs> say. And yet I'm jolly sure that there was a cock crowing mm -hmm. while it was going on. And in the same way, uh, compare newspaper reports of the same event, they'll disagree, but that doesn't mean nothing happened. And in the same way, I think mm. these accounts are the sort of eyewitness accounts that say uh, it's all very quick and breathless and, and you know, mm. we may have got some of the details inside out, but that doesn't mean that it was all made up 20 years later, very far from it. Mm. Now, of course, Matthew and Mark are very similar accounts, but then Mark breaks off. I do think, actually, that Mark did have a longer ending, which we've now lost. Um, Luke tells his story as the story of the new creation. It's uh, a kind of an opening up of a new world. The Emmaus Road story sets the tone for the life of the church, the scriptures and the breaking of the bread. And John has this series of character vignettes, Thomas and Mary and so on. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful set of images there which they are just starting to develop so that John's invitation, come and have breakfast, sounds to me like the invitation mm. to anyone who has toiled all night and taken nothing and now mm. needs to meet the mysterious stranger on the beach. So this is all pointing on to the question which we'll do next time, which is uh, the whole question of what we make of this. But clearly there's so much in these strange gospel stories. We need to kick it around a bit. I think it's curious that we have four Gospels and not just one. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about that just briefly? <laughs> I think you suggested there's the mm -hmm. variety there. Mm -hmm. Was the mm -hmm. church not uncomfortable in saying, perhaps we should select this one and let the other ones ride? Well, of course, there were some people in the second and third century who said it would be much neater to have just one. There's mm -hmm. a famous guy called Tatian who made a composite edition, as some people have tried to do since. Mm -hmm. but. Most of the early Christians known to us on through the next century or two basically said, no, nope, it's these four, that's the way it mm -hmm. should be. They invented grand theories like the four beasts of Ezekiel yeah. and the four winds and so on. But that was kind of an elaborate way of saying something that they knew down here, mm -hmm. that this fourfold witness gives us the full Jesus, the full story. Of course, this is a much bigger question than just the resurrection narratives. But, uh, you know, it's like biographies. I've got four or five biographies of C.S. Mm -hmm. Lewis, and they mm -hmm. each tell me something about the man mm -hmm. which the other ones don't. And some of them may have got it a bit distorted. I don't know. I didn't know Lewis myself. I wish I did. But um, I think they're all giving us quite valid windows because human beings in general mm -hmm. are highly complex creatures. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, though a very integrated human being, seems to have been a very complex man as well. Mm -hmm. You can tell the story this way, you can tell it that way. So, of course, the other question is, what about Thomas or Q or mm -hmm. all this other stuff? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if Q existed, and, and I, I'm a heretic on that, mm -hmm. but um, I think that Thomas was considerably later than the canonical Gospels and largely derivative from them, though not maybe entirely. And, of course, other people were trying to tell other stories about Jesus and to make this message serve other worldviews. Mm. And we could get into that, but perhaps yeah. not now, because they don't talk about the resurrection. It is interesting that in spite of the variety of ways that story gets shaped by mm -hmm. 
where disciples finally find themselves at the end of Gospels and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. There are so many similar elements. Yes. And some of those are um, the kind of continuity that you would expect in a Jewish tradition. So that women as not good witnesses, um, but still the ones who would go to anoint a dead body. Yes, yes. Uh, so That's it, right. there's a very uh -huh. similitude there. There's yes. something yeah. like truth being told yes. there. Yes. Um, and uh, and it works and 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 though Jesus doesn't dazzle, yes. the messengers do. Yes, and that's yeah, right yeah, out yeah. of the long story yeah. of the way God's messengers sometimes appear to people. And uh, and so yeah. the people who go to the tomb are able to yes. imagine that these messengers come from some place they don't exactly know. They, they know enough to be afraid. Yes, yes. Now that, that's it's extremely wonderful. interesting because it, they are at one level very biblical stories and yet nobody in the Old Testament um, ever rises from the dead. Exactly. Like mm -hmm. um, it's a new it's, thing. They didn't wonderful. make it up out of the scriptures uh, by just saying let's tell one of those stories again. And yet it belongs in that Jewish world. And you, I have a sense that in our culture today a lot of people are more open mm -hmm. to not only angels, but to God doing things that we didn't expect. You know, when I was growing up, mm. it was very much, we know miracles don't occur, and there it is. Mm -hmm. And there are still quite a lot of people who take that line. But there are now quite a lot who, for sometimes for Christian reasons, sometimes for New Age reasons or whatever, are saying, oh, the world is a very mysterious place. Mm -hmm. you know, people do get to walk on water sometimes, and so on and so forth. But usually, in my experience, even people who say that balk at saying, that actually Jesus rose bodily from the dead. Mm -hmm. And uh, clearly that is what all four of those Gospels are saying. I'm wondering if you could imagine there having been written a Gospel without the resurrection narratives. There's mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. of material there about his teaching, about his healing, um, mm -hmm. about his interacting with the religious authorities. Was that not a significant story yeah. in and of itself? Well, it would have been. It could have been. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, let's just try to imagine yeah. for a moment, supposing the resurrection or n nothing like it had ever occurred, mm -hmm. then it seems to me that for a short while, maybe even for a generation, the people who had followed Jesus might well have told stories about him. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that Josephus, the Jewish historian writing a generation later, tells the story, difficult to know exactly what he means by it all, mm -hmm. of Jesus who was a good man and did certain yeah. things, etc. And then Josephus says at the end, and the funny thing is, you know, the tribe of these Christians has still not died out. Mm -hmm. Isn't that odd? Yeah. Right. Um, and you can imagine people telling those stories about mm -hmm. this extraordinary man who was around for a while. Yeah. But they wouldn't have the same feel or flavor. Mm -hmm. They would actually be rather like, if you think of the Old Testament as a whole story, mm -hmm. it is a story in search of an ending. It's waiting for something mm. to happen. Mm -hmm. Because you see, yes. if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, whatever you would have written, it couldn't have been a gospel because the word gospel means good news. Mm. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then what you have is something which isn't good news, namely another failed messianic movement. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yes, there would have been stories, there could have been stories, they could have gone on telling them for a while, mm -hmm. but it would have been... Uh, a poignant memory. Yeah. It would not have been a gospel. Or even a provocative one. It could have been a provocative memory. It could yes. be yes. prophecy according yeah. to Jesus. Yes. Mm -hmm. and yes. Along with yeah. Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Yeah. Yes. And, yes. Um, they, they might. They might have said that. And a calling to Israel. Yeah. Uh, or, it, or it could have collapsed into being a version of Plato's picture of Socrates. Mm -hmm. You know, Socrates' death was very tragic, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the end of philosophy. We could still, and he was going to die sometime anyway, and mm -hmm. so we could carry on. Um, or a Maccabean yeah. martyr story. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. it, it, tortured by the Romans and still unwilling that's, to renounce. That's right. It. But, but the Maccabean martyr stories are still not the good news. I right. mean, the good news is an Isaiah word mm -hmm. w as well as a Caesar word, and it means <laughs> something has happened which has broken into God's world as a mm -hmm. result of which everything's different. Mm -hmm. And the, the death of another Messiah, however interesting and fascinating a character he was, mm -hmm. would, would not be, be just that good that news. Be bad same news. old thing. Exactly. Yeah. We, we've had yeah. those before. And, and that's the curious thing. I know that uh, a number of people have uh, read and heard about the Jesus Seminar mm -hmm. and, and these theologians trying to find out what the power of Jesus is, but it seems as I've read through it, they've taken so much of the material that guts out of it, mm -hmm. you're not left with much and in a sense of a Jesus who does not rise from mm -hmm. the dead. Mm -hmm. um, 
How are you working with that? Well, yes, I, I mean, the Jesus Seminar made, so to speak, yeah. no bones of the fact that they were uh, starting with the assumption that dead people don't rise, mm -hmm. and that therefore the stories must really mean something else. And mm -hmm. there are dozens of different ways of doing that. Uh, several scholars who we could name um, have tried different ways of saying that it was because they studied the scriptures so assiduously mm. that uh, they found this business of the third day in Hosea. So they wrote stories okay. about the third day. Mm. And, and, you know, it's just actually wildly implausible. Mm. Um, they even went to the lengths, the Jesus Seminar, of um, uh, bringing a young woman who worked in, in a mortuary to testify to the Jesus Seminar that she had examined a lot of dead bodies, and when they were dead, they tended to stay dead. Oh my. And, and, you know, th this, this, <laughs> was a this was supposed to be a great sort of science. <laughs> now, we are scientists today, we know this. Mm -hmm. and, and the silly thing yeah. is that the early Christians would have said to a man and to a woman, mm -hmm dead people stay dead mm -hmm. and this was different they mm -hmm. didn't say oh this stuff happens all over the place that's right and uh, mm -hmm. it is it is precisely part of the gospel that it doesn't happen to everyone else mm -hmm. but that it jolly well did to jesus it's hard to know quite quite where to go with that <laughs> yeah. for for many people i yeah. think in this day and age on the one hand it's so implausible and it was so long ago and mm -hmm. what can it possibly mean for us mm -hmm. on the other hand uh that sense of the world changing so fast mm. so that some of us find ourselves mystified by inventions uh, mm. in our own lifetime mm. Mm -hmm. and expect to be fully mystified mm -hmm. by ones that come in yes, the next. Yes. It gives us yes. a little more room to it, think it may, about yep. mystery and change. And I, I would agree with that, though I've discovered that even quite a few people who are open to new mystery and new change and so on still do draw the line the bodily mm -hmm. resurrection. Uh, one friend of mine will be open to all sorts of things, but will say, I just don't think God does that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Okay. And that's, of course, where it comes from. For a lot of people, mm -hmm. it goes with a view of God, and they're frightened yes, that if they buy that. into agreeing that the mm -hmm. Gospels were really telling it like it was, what they're saying is that there is a God who is an intervening God, one who reaches in from outside to do different things. Mm -hmm. And I want to say as clearly as I can, that's not the picture in the New Testament because the God of the New Testament, like the God of the Old Testament, mm -hmm. is not a God who is normally outside the process and who occasionally reaches in and intervenes, mm -hmm. but a God who is always mysteriously present. And sometimes that mysterious presence is a grieving presence because of the awful things that are going on and God's suffering with the world. Other times that is a powerful presence where God, the present God, does things that we didn't expect. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me the whole story of Israel is about a series of climaxes of God doing some little things we didn't expect, building up to something big which we really would never have imagined. Mm -hmm. And finally, it looks as though he did that in such a striking way with the resurrection of Jesus. I've had students raise the issue that if God is a suffering God and suffers with us, what good is God? Mm. Where is the power of God to change mm. things? It, it's a, it's a two-edged sword, that, isn't it? Because yes, it is. actually, you know, one of my favorite of the First World War poems um, is called Jesus of the Scars by Edmund Silito, and uh, he talks about the other gods versus Jesus. And he says the other gods were strong. And you know, First World War poet, you know, he was thinking about the powers of military might. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode but thou didst stumble to a throne. And then he says from the depths of the trenches in the First World War, but to our wounds only God's wounds can speak, mm. and not mm. a God has wounds but thou alone. Mm. It's a wonderful poem that this is the distinctive thing about this God, that this is the God who suffers mm. with his people. But then, of course, the resurrection says mm -hmm. that this God suffers in order to take the evil and pain of the world onto himself and to deal with it. It's not just that God is wallowing there along mm. with us. Yes. Yes. It's that God is taking it and coming through the other side. And to have a powerful God who strode through the world, you know, ignoring suffering to right and left, no thank you. That's, that's not the God we, we need. So without the, the resurrection, yeah. that suffering God is the, the, without the resurrection, the suffering God would, would God just be a pantheistic, yes. a rather sort of negative pantheistic yes. God, a rather technical term. I feel God. your pain. Yeah, yeah. That's, God. that's right. <laughs> well, gee, thanks. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Exactly. But, and that's why the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, as we've got it in mm -hmm. the gospel traditions, really resonates out in all sorts of directions. As we were saying before, 
if it's going to make sense, it must make sense within the world of the first century. Mm -hmm. But then since the Jews believed that God had called Israel to be the light of the world, it must yeah. then make sense in and for the whole cosmos out beyond. And uh, that's what the early Christians discovered with this real sense of excitement that, hey, you tell this story on the street in Corinth or Athens mm -hmm. or Rome, and some people will say you're out of your mind, and other people will find that when you tell that story, strange things happen mm -hmm. to them, and they find they believe it. And you know, a lot of early Christian faith, I think, takes the form of, I think this is probably crazy, but mm -hmm. it's just got me by the guts, and mm -hmm. this is where I am now. And Paul says, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And they find as they are grasped in that way that their lives are changed and their priorities are reordered and they start to pray in new ways and all sorts of things happen. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering how that happens in our own day when we've heard these stories mm -hmm. so much. Yeah. Stained glass window words. Yeah. yeah. You yes. just see them and you don't. Where, where yeah. comes the surprise now? Mm -hmm for us or what we didn't expect. Well, mm -hmm. of course that's what God did. Mm -hmm. and it, it's difficult, isn't it? Because we, we speak to two quite different constituencies or audiences. On the one hand, there are the residual skeptics and there are millions of them in our mm -hmm. country. Which oh is we know God didn't do this, it's yeah. just an old fairy tale. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, as you say, there are, if, you, I, if I dare say, the bored Christians mm -hmm. who say, oh, we've, mm -hmm. heard, we've yeah. heard all this before. Yeah. Okay, it's Easter, it's Easter eggs and bunnies and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's when I want yeah. to say, again, as we said before, learn to read John's Gospel as poetry. And that doesn't mean it didn't happen, but learn to feel the poetry and the metaphorical levels. I had an email from somebody not long ago who was saying, is it possible to believe both that it actually happened and that it has all these wonderful layers mm -hmm. of meaning? Mm -hmm. And I said, of course, that's what the whole Bible is about, things that actually happen that have wonderful layers of meaning. Mm -hmm. And we have split off event from meaning in our culture, and that's disastrous, and it's precisely mm -hmm. something like the resurrection which is pulling it back together again. Mm -hmm. See, for me, one of the real magic moments in this whole story is the burial and then the resurrection of Jesus, mm -hmm. because the way John tells the story, John is very alert to uh, symbolisms of number mm. and his, uh, there's lots of sevens in John's yeah. Gospel. And I think John is very clear that Jesus rose from the dead very early in the morning on the first day of the week. And that means this is the beginning of a new creation. Mm -hmm. What does that say about Jesus' burial? It says that on the seventh day, God rested in the tomb. And this is like the mm. work of creation is now mm -hmm. finished. On the cross, Jesus says it's accomplished, it's finished. Mm -hmm. and, and now God is resting in the tomb. And now the new creation mm -hmm. is beginning. And as soon as you see that, then, you know, with every sunrise, from where I live, I can watch the sun rising over the sea in the morning. And often I am just struck by the power of that imagery of the new day. And John is saying, that's what's happening for the whole cosmos when Jesus rose again. You know, it's not just Easter eggs, fluffy chicks, and new spring bonnets for ladies in church. We're talking about the beginning of God's new world, and you are the mm -hmm. beneficiaries and the agents of it. So that's where I would start to, to shake people out of their slumbers and mm -hmm. to say, hey, this Easter message has actually got something in it mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. But we're going to need new stories and new yeah. art and new poetry and new music mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. One of, the, uh, one of the college teachers in one of the American colleges that I know said that his biggest struggle with students was that they would come into his class, and he taught in the religion mm -hmm. department. I don't know exactly what courses he taught. Students would come and they would have two ideas about how to think about truth. One was scientific truth that would be presumably experientially verifiable or not, mm -hmm. and the other was um, objective history. Mm which oh, uh, oh, could right. be said to really have happened. Mm -hmm. And yeah. everything else wasn't somehow true. Oh, mm -hmm. yes, yes, and that's, yes. that is a tremendously Th difficult that, place. That Your is, question yeah, typifies it. That, that, is, that is devastating, and it seems to me it points us to something which I think Jesus' resurrection can really help us with, and that is a sense of how we know things. Yes, And really we cool. live at a point in our culture where I think it's a good thing that people are asking the question again, how do we know things? Because mm -hmm. I, I grew up in exactly that world. There was stuff that could basically be put in a test tube or its historical equivalent. Mm -hmm. And then there was fuzzy stuff like aesthetics, you know, beauty mm -hmm. and, and love and all those things. 
and as one of the great Roman Catholic philosophers of the last generation, Bernard Lonergan, stood that stuff on its head. He said, actually, the prime mode of knowing is love. Mm -hmm. And I find, as I read the resurrection stories, that they do to me rather what Paul says in, in Galatians at one point, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. They are about the love of the Creator God saying to the whole cosmos, it's okay, mm -hmm. I've got you, we're coming through this mm -hmm. one, yeah. you know. Beautiful. And uh, you can't put that into a test tube, it's mm -hmm. far more important <laughs> than that, far more important than that. And I want to say that, you know, the beauty of music, of scenery, of, of literature, of a sunrise, is actually far more important than stuff that you can just uh, put a tick beside as a little mm -hmm. proposition here and there. And, and you see, this, this is what the resurrection does, and I think this is what the gospel writers are saying the resurrection does. They're taking the Jewish stories and they're retelling those Jewish stories as focused on and climaxing in Jesus. And then they're showing that all of that led to the cross. And then they're saying, now there is a whole new world that whole new world began on Easter morning. It is continuing with the work of the Spirit, God's Spirit, Jesus' Spirit, giving new life to people and to the world now. It will reach its own consummation in God's eventual new world. But in this process, although of course we learn to be suspicious of knowledge of this sort and that and to test things out, we are basically offered a way of looking at the world which is a way modeled on love, on the love of God for creation, on the love of God for Jesus, and on that Jesus-shaped, suffering and victorious love of God coming out through Jesus, coming out of the tomb on Easter morning to say to us, it's okay, we're coming through this one, and you are my people now for the world. Thank you.